I know I get crazy with the title, but Hey Jude, you know the song Hey Jude. Um, you know, you take a sad song and make it better. Uh, take something bad and make it better. And that's kind of uh, the lesson today. Speedy mentioned last week, um, he has this ability every once in a while, I give him credit for this, that he says something really profound. Uh, and I thought when he said, um, many believe in God, but how many believe God? And, and Jude is delivering this letter, and it's what, like Derek said, you know, it's one chapter. It's, it's very short, um, and he explains why he's writing this letter. He's, uh, you know, kind of like excited to say, I want to share with you uh, about our common salvation. But, and it takes on this tone, and all of a sudden, uh, you're asked, when, Jude is a nice letter, it's short, you can read it pretty quickly in its context all together. And so the question is, if you are going to dramatize this letter, um, as you read through it, what comes to mind? What kind of theme music would you put to this? And that kind of helps. Uh, this one's a, an easier one. Not all letters are kind of uh, dramatic like this, but this one, if you're going to put theme music to it, you might say, uh, I was very eager to write, it's kind of upbeat, but I have this and all of a sudden, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, the tone really gets serious. And so, but what I want to do is just in these first three verses is kind of explain something um, about Jude and what he's doing here. So very simply, um, the three verses go, there's a position. Jude has a position in verse 1. In verse 2, he's going to make a prescription. It's very important in this letter to set this tone right from the beginning with this per, per position. What is my position? And what is my prescription? And it's very consistent with the bulletin today, if you look at uh, a soft word turns away wrath, uh, anyway, you know, you know where he put it, oh, it's right here. Uh, it's right in the, the bulletin, a soft answer turns away wrath. And the whole thing in there is about, um, you know, oftentimes when we're confronted with a problem or a situation, um, our uh, initial reaction is, oh, I know how to solve that. We, we, our mind just goes into work. When we had, uh, a few months ago, we had um, um, Zane and Tay Perkins here, and they did that presentation on personalities. And I was, it's so revealing. I think everybody should understand this. It would help a lot of conflict resolutions if we just understood each other, right? If we could see each other, because so much conflict comes from that. But there are certain people, their personality is just, here's a problem, fix it. And other people need to analyze it and, you know, what's really the problem? Or, you know, they want to empathize, I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, but, um, so we don't handle situations the same. Um, so look at how Jude begins this letter. He says, if you're not there, it's Jude is this little short letter right before the last book in our Bible, before Revelation is Jude. And Jude in the greeting says, Jude, a servant. And I went and looked that up, not that I didn't know it already, I did know this, but that word, and um, I don't like to throw around Greek words because I don't ever pronounce them right. Uh, but I used to tease my classmates about this as their fellow doulases. This is, the word is doulos, and this word, uh, this Greek word for servant is actually a slave or a bond slave. 
um, which means an indebted one. He says, a servant of Jesus Christ, and watch this, and brother of James. Now, Jude is, we would say, I don't like this term, but um, this, is, this is how it's coined. Uh, Jude would be a half-brother of Jesus. Forgive me for saying that. Jude doesn't say, hey, I'm the Jude that's Jesus' brother. He does not say that. He says, I'm the brother of James, who's also brother of Jesus. But his position is, and we were talking about this this morning, is not a position of, I have status, you need to listen to me. No. Our position is servant. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James. And he says, basically, and I'm writing to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. And this Greek word, and I'm not even going to attempt this one, the word that the English version translates kept, um, Rich will find this interesting because he can see it, uh, in the King James, in verse 1, that word kept for Jesus is translated or rendered preserved, which is a good, it's a good rendering, preserved for Jesus Christ. But if you drop down to verse 6, the same Greek word shows up again, and it's these others are kept so Jude's making a contrast. Um, those who are in God are kept for God, but those who aren't are kept for gloomy darkness, for judgment. It's the same word, but in uh, King James, in verse 1 says preserved for Christ, and in verse 6 says reserved for judgment. It's the same word, but they render it different because of its context and I think but I like kept because in the English Standard Version you can directly see the contrast you're either kept for Christ or you're kept for something else okay so right at the beginning Jude is identifying a position we as disciples of those who are sanctified and made holy by God's Word uh, and by the gospel uh, he keeps us, but we are servants. Our position is to serve others. And uh, we mentioned this the other day. Um, the whole law, Jesus says, hangs on love your neighbor as yourself. But in the new covenant, uh, we were looking at this Thursday, the new covenant, um, there is a different kind of love that Jesus demonstrates. It's actually in John chapter 15, verse 13, but where Jesus says, no greater love has anyone than he who will lay down his life for his friends. Um, Jesus shows, and in Philippians chapter 2, when Paul describes uh, Jesus, he said he emptied himself of this glory. He says, you need to have the same mind that was in Christ. So this idea of emptying yourself. Now that's important because when we get to the problem, we have the position. Now we're going to give the prescription and it's important to establish this first before we address the problem, especially in today's world where everybody is ready to jump down your throat <laughs> for anything. Just say the wrong thing to me. Uh, everybody is uh, on edge. And he says, Here's your prescription. You need to have this in mind. Mercy, peace, and love. Mercy, peace, and love. Without which, nobody hears you. And we have this, this saying, um, and it is so true, um, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. If, if, if am I trying to win an argument? Am I recognizing here's a problem and I'm going to 
smash it down, destroy it. Um, well, this isn't going to work very well because of the problem. And the problem begins to be identified in verse 3. So he says, here's the position. We need to have the position of, and this is why I say I'm talking to me. And I'm thinking about uh, having people <laughs> filling up our parking lot and setting up tables and being willing to field questions. Um, we have a limited, very short window right now. There are parking lots going in uh, in May. Sometime in May, their parking lot will be done. And, um, but we have a whole lot of folks, uh, and they have questions. And as the weather gets warmer, now we're having some opportunities. And so this is really for me. It is not uh, an indictment here, OK? <laughs> uh, but the. But the problem is pretty profound, and I think you'll see an application here. Verse 3, Jude says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. <clears throat> it's similar, but not exactly the same as... But I want to draw this comparison as the, one of the first letters, one of the earliest letters to the church uh, that, was, that was saved and disseminated was Paul's letter to the Galatians. And it's, it, it, in, in the academic world, it's a very controversial letter because of the harsh language that Paul uses in there. He, he, he's, he's almost like, I can't believe this. He starts out the letter, I'm astonished that you would turn so quickly to another gospel. And in Galatians, I want to read this line because this is Galatians chapter 4, verses 19. Paul says, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul is genuinely, could we say frustrated, like in that bulletin article today, um, frustrated with what he sees. Um, the gospel is being perverted, and Paul is saying, how could you entertain that? Um, but his heart is, you know, my desire is if I could just get Christ formed in you, to where you're not following every wind of doctrine, he would say in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, the reason why these gifts were given to the body was to build up the body so that we can all attain this maturity so that we're not tossed to and fro. Or when we engage somebody, they don't unsettle us. Um, and this is similar. Jude is saying there's... And by the way, this faith to contend for is the faith as sure and as definite the article as Jesus is the Lord, the Christ, the Messiah. There is no other. Let me tell you what's going on here. And we've been, we've, we've been nibbling at the edges of this for a while now. And so I've been really kind of how, how, how can I present this? This is one of the most difficult concepts, I think, for us to get our minds around is 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, um, his blood continually cleanses us. Uh, we have fellowship with him. Um, and that is uninterrupted fellowship. But we have this idea that when I make a mistake, I'm out of fellowship, you know, and I'm, I'm walking in and out. And that's, that's not right, but watch what's happening here. Verse four in Jude, he says, for certain people have crept in, and this unnoticed, and this is why I'm making it clear, I'm not talking about you visitors that crept in here today. No, <laughs> uh, I'm not talking about, this is not, we're not dealing with this issue, okay? That's not the point here. But he says, for certain 
people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were des designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So why did I relate having visitors here, having people working here and, and talking to them or meeting folks you know, at breakfast time or whatever, um, is I believe we have, we have this generational problem here. Um, it's worldwide, I, mean, I don't mean here at South Road, I mean it's just, it just happens. Things go in cycles. Uh, Q is apt to point that out always to us. <laughs> Things are, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, all right? It's all happened before. But I believe there's an opportunity right now. I've been saying, it's my perception, that people have a lot of questions. We all, a lot of us got really close to a member that was only here for a short time and then he passed. But his desire, his zeal uh, to gain this understanding because he knew his, he was terminal, he knew his time was limited. And, um, but he represents a large community out there that grew up with understanding there is a God, they believe in God, but how do you believe God? But they, because of circumstances where they were and life got busy, they ended up um, getting hurt in a church family or some kind of church setting and just kind of, I don't want to deal with that anymore. But now they're getting older and they have questions and they see, wow, this is, uh, the world is really in turmoil now. This can't be right. There, there's got to be some answers that make sense. Well, let me tell you what's happening. And it's no different than what happened, uh, I've been mentioning this great apostasy right at the end of the apostolic age. Um, the church quickly went into this apostasy. And what, what causes it is this verse four in Jude. Jude says that there are people that pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and watch this, and deny our only master and Lord. This is so uh, enticing and deceiving at the same time. Um, many religions outside of the religion, outside of God and his eternal plan, appeal to people at the base level, we're talking about ego and uh, self, that I am God. Somehow I just forgot that or I don't know it. It, it. So at its core is you're really God and you need to awaken that spirit. Now it's taught in many different ways, but one of them, because I've been mentioning Gnostics, but I want to put it in, in simpler terms. There's this idea that was, came out of the motivational world as to appeal to a larger audience. There's this idea and... and um, I think it may have been coined by um, Napoleon Hill when he used the term, there's this infinite intelligence out there. And the idea is what many religions view Jesus as somebody who mastered the mystery. He's just a master. He learned how to achieve a certain level of mastery that allowed him to manipulate matter itself. But that's available to anybody who can discipline themselves. So when he says they deny our only master and Lord, as what I mentioned this morning, it's that base thing that says, I want to believe that I really am God. I just forgot or I just, I don't know it. I'm living in some kind of dream world. And if I can meditate and go to this right place, I can access this. So many of the scriptures start to clear up when you understand this problem. Um, naming the names in Ephesians. This idea, when I was in Asia, um, it's this idea that if you're successful, 
everybody wants to know which God did you appease and in which order and how did you do that? And if I hit the sequence right, I hit the jackpot and all of a sudden life has to give me what I, what I want. That, that's the idea, that's the uh, mystic religion um, is that at some point you can be like Jesus if you just discipline yourself. And so what I'm saying is people know, there are a lot of people that know there's something wrong with that, but they don't know, uh, they haven't had anybody um, help them see that and their idea, most of uh, religion in the world, like uh, Bill Mayer would say, religion is the root of all evil. In other words, people know better, the religious leaders know better, they know there's no God, they're just using you, the, the uneducated, the simple-minded, to manipulate you or to con you, and it keeps control over you. So they, they, they accept and promote religious centers um, as a way to control people. And you see how that plays into that base uh, idea. But people intuitively know there's something, there's something more here. There's something about God. Um, when we submit to God and empty ourselves and look to others with this prescription of mercy, peace, and love, to genuinely help them on their path by showing them that I'm on this path, uh, and what questions do you have? You know, I have the very same question. In our Wednesday afternoon group, I like, we use this example. I love this example because it's, I'm dealing with workers. So you have a worker, you have Peter the fisherman. Peter's a very competent businessman. He knows his business. And Jesus enters his life and his partners say, hey, we found could this be the Messiah? And Peter said, oh my goodness, you know, I, let me go straighten these guys out or I'm never going to get an honest day's work out of them. So, so Peter goes and he has an encounter with Jesus. He said, oh, that's different. I've never seen that before. Um, Jesus is doing things that you cannot do. That has to mean something. Um, I, I was semi-joking that a lot of uh, profound thinkers and philosophers that set out to help a family member overcome their following this fairy tale, uh, they have a word for them. Those who dedicated themselves to proving this wrong, they're called Christians. Because in, attempt, in their attempt to help a family member understand they're being duped, they actually studied it and became a Christian. Peter went out and so on. Peter's a fisherman, like most hardworking people. I don't have time to fool around with this stuff, but then he encounters Jesus and he, nope, there's something different about this guy. So when Jesus calls Peter, it wasn't Peter says, yes, master, I'll follow you. And he had no relationship with him. He went out and saw, and you know, at some point you might say, well, if this man is a, is a fraud, that's the best fraud, I'm willing to follow that. You know, however it takes you to submit yourself to this God, as Rich said this morning, that not only emptied himself and came down here and served us, but the wrath of God that was intended for all of us for sin was manifested in Jesus on the cross. He took it. He took the wrath of God for the penalty that I deserve. He bore it to the grave and because his sacrifice was the only one that was acceptable to God, he raised from the dead, showing us that he had victory over death and he's our victory. 
and he's our avenue for eternal life. So this morning, and we're gathered around this table, and this table of fellowship is, we need to stay humble and be servants where we're helping people. You cannot help people that you don't have rapport with. So it's relational. That's where the discipleship comes in. But mercy, peace, and love must be paramount in our approach to people and the way we interact with people or they won't be able to hear what we're saying. Uh, and our, am I changing? Am I being transformed by this knowledge? Um, so that I can help others uh, along this path. So Jesus con uh, consecrated us, conscripted us into this fellowship. And the world today is looking for these answers. And if we'll just be patient and let the questions what are the questions that they have? We have a, a, a really unique situation here. And um, I reminded folks on Wednesday, when Ron first started visiting us, it was weeks, if not a couple of months, before Ron ever came into the building. <laughs> we spent our afternoons outside talking. And so we have this opportunity taking place now. Um, we also have um, these we're very excited about these uh, new prospective students and everything is coming together at the right time to help uh, invite folks in uh, with, with especially a couple of young families. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you today. Um, we are going to get into some uh, characters in the Old Testament now going forward, but um, I wanted to share that position, prescription, and problem. Um, there is nothing in this world that is so messed up that God can't fix. And there's a lot of brokenness, and God can fix that brokenness. And people want to know and, uh, and hear that and have hope. Um, not the same message. Well, we're all going to crash and burn soon anyway, so nothing matters. Eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, no, that's, that's not right. Uh, the future is really looking bright. Um, and there's a whole new generation, a whole new spirit coming up. Position, prescription, problem. Uh, I hope that helps today. If there's anything that you have a special need, uh, we have this song of invitation. Uh, and we'll pray with you, and if more is needed, um, we'll look to that as well as we sing this invitation song. <laughs> 